Our community is very blessed to have parachurch ministries that relate to all the congregations in the city that are such a strength to us. And Project 44 is one of those ministries. And Jennifer Sterling is here to tell us about it. She's the daughter of Ben and Margaret Fields, who founded the ministry. Good morning. It's good to be here and see all of you this morning. So I'm just going to take a few moments to tell you uh, about Project 44 and who we are and what we do. So Project 44, our name comes from the 44th book of the Bible, which is Acts. Our mission is to go outside the walls of the church and to be the church in the world. Meet people where they are and help meet their needs where they are. Um, so it was, it was started with a car ministry. My dad is a mechanic, and he has a shop. And, you know, over the years, people would kind of drop cars off, say, I don't really think this is worth fixing anymore. Find someone who needs this, give it to them, um, and maybe it can bless them. So that kind of turned into an actual ministry. So we started with people donating cars, fixing them, and giving them to those in need. Um, Soon, after we started doing that, we started seeing a need for families who who needed a car, that there was more going on, um, and started offering counseling services called Sanctuary Counseling based on a local church that provided um, space for us to offer those services to meet more of the needs of the whole person. Um, Soon after that, we were called to uh, feeding people. It started with Community Garden, and uh, soon we were, we were given the opportunity to use some land out here in Granbury. Actually, it's just down 377. Take a ride on 167. We're right over there. Um, and we grow organic produce and give it to families, shelters, food pantries, communities who need that fresh produce. If you go to a food pantry, there's only non-perishable foods. Is that the nourishment and the nutrients that helps grow us and, and mold us? No. Um, And so we see that as, you know, every person is worth the dignity of that fresh organic produce. Um, So we're here to tell you about all of those things. Um, And the way, how can you be involved with us? We always need help. One, of course, is prayers. First and foremost, prayers for our mission and our ministry that we continue to do in Tarrant and Hood County. Um, But the way that we continue to give cars away is people give us cars. They're donated. We go through the process and do that paperwork. Um, and then with the farm out here in Granbury, since you guys are local, um, we always have to have help. We are volunteer run. We have to have help planting and harvesting so that that food can be given to all of those people. We don't really have full-time staff that do that all the time. So uh, for us to continue to bless other people, we would love for you guys to be involved. Thank you so much. Thank you. Let's pray for this ministry. Lord, we thank you for the ministries that you're raising up in this city, beyond the walls of local churches. Thank you, Lord, for Jennifer and her husband, Mr. Sterling, and her parents, Ben and Margaret Fields. Thank you, Lord, for all the volunteers that are the strength of this ministry. Lord, use this ministry not only to strengthen marriages, but to raise up laborers for your harvest, literally in harvesting crops for the harvesting of souls for the purpose of your kingdom. Lord, we pray that you would provide automobiles for those in need because, Lord, in this town we don't have public transit. People need vehicles. And so, Lord, we thank you for raising up Project 44, Lord. May this coming year, Lord, be a year of unprecedented prosperity for them and provision through them. And, Lord, if there's anyone here that's to be involved in that, Lord, speak to our hearts even now. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you so much. Thank you. Today's notes are in your bulletin. If you have your Bibles, turn to Jeremiah chapter 31 the 31st chapter of the book the prophet Jeremiah wrote. You know, this isn't Jeremiah's first book. The first book he wrote got destroyed, so he had to do a rewrite. Guess what? Even more stuff. Hallelujah. So no matter what you're going through, if you experience loss, guess what? The Lord is able to do more. That's not the sermon. That's just another little thing there. All right, Jeremiah 31, verse 31 says, Behold, which means look, open up your eyes, take notice. The days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant. Can we say new? 
with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. That's the people of God. Verse 32, not according to the covenant which I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. That's the covenant he made with them in the wilderness through the prophet Moses. My covenant which they broke, though I was a husband to them, says the Lord. This new covenant in the New Testament is called the better covenant. Verse 33, but this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days. What's those days? The days that are past, not the days that are coming. Says the Lord, I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. And I will be their God and they shall be my people. In the old covenant, there was laws written on stone who served the Ten Commandments, plus over 600 other laws, how to carry out the Ten Commandments. And they hadn't received the law before they already were breaking it. The law cannot remove sin. It can only expose it. I know our nation makes more and more laws. forgot what the last count was. I think not counting your homeowner association regulations. We've got, we're governed by about six feet of books, laws. That was before Obamacare. Pages and pages of laws. They cannot make us righteous. They can establish order so that wrongdoers can be punished. And it hopes in the punishment rehabilitation happens. I think we have a lot to learn as a culture about rehabilitation. But Christ came to bring a new covenant that would do more than rehabilitation, would absolutely initiate a new thing, a relationship with God where he would write his law in our hearts, not the Ten Commandments, but what the Ten Commandments was based on, loving God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, loving our neighbor as ourself. It's a desire to please him. It's as though Jesus in our hearts creates new desires or new want-tos. He changes our want-tos. The law could only expose our desire to disobey. But the new covenant changes our desires to obey. And here's the consequence of this new covenant. Verse 34, No more shall every man teach his neighbor... And every man his brother saying, know the Lord. Nobody's going to say that. Because, or for, they all shall know me. From the least of them to the greatest of them. No longer just for the holy man or the holy women of God. Yes. But all of us, from children to senior citizens, We all can know the Lord without living in a monastery and living on bread and water. We can know the Lord through the new covenant. For I will, says the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and their sin. I will remember no more. Iniquity is what makes us sin. The sin of adultery is based on the iniquity of lust. So Jesus raised the level of the law of Moses to the issue of the heart dealing with the desires of our hearts that make us sin. And he promises to forgive our iniquity in this new covenant. He was bruised, inwardly wounded, for our inward inclination to sin. We live in a culture that wants to celebrate iniquity, embrace it as a new reality, a new enlightenment. My iniquity is no longer a problem. It's my identity. It's who I am. So don't talk to me about getting drunk and beating my wife. I'm who I am because I'm Irish. That's the only ethnicity I can poke fun at because I'm Irish. He forgives our iniquity and changes our lives. So don't bypass this new covenant and try to embrace your iniquity as though it's something to be celebrated. It's not anything to be proud of. And there's sin I will remember no more. This is better than forgetting. 
He chooses to not remember. You ever forget something and then remember it? You know? I forget to go to the store and I pull in the driveway and suddenly I remember. Oops. Or forget to lock the house or forget my cell phone and pull out on the highway and then suddenly I remember. Well, God doesn't forget our sins. That would be weakness. He chooses to not remember it. That's awesome. And what he wills comes to pass. He's almighty God. Someone asked Mother Teresa what she thought about a certain person that had highly offended her years earlier. And she said, why are you bringing that up? I distinctly remember forgetting that years ago. I'd like to speak to you today a New Year's sermon. Everybody, Happy New Year. See you next year. Amen. I love new things. Who likes new things? I like new chapters. There's a new chapter in our family. Part of our family has moved back to Texas. With a new one. There she is with her hands raised. Clapping for us. Speaking to you today on the subject, knowing God in newness. Hopefully I don't say Newman during this sermon. Newness. It's in the Bible. It's in the dictionary. Knowing God, we're in a season of talking about knowing God. As we grow in knowing God, knowing God in newness, it's, it's not a rut of a relationship. Uh, romance doesn't have to be rekindled in this marriage. It's a life of newness in him that I want to focus on today. Ten things on newness. First of all, newness requires a changing of the old. When Christ was asked, how come his disciples didn't fast and practice high-level devotion, he said these words in Luke 5, 36. He actually said these words in a couple of the other Gospels as well, Matthew and Mark. He says, no one puts a piece from a new garment on an old one. Otherwise, the new makes a tear. How? Well, when the new begins to shrink, it tears your stitches. And also the piece that was taken out of the new does not match the old. When you mend clothing, you try your best to match in age and color what you're repairing. Verse 37, and no one puts new wine into old wineskins. If you're a winemaker, you understand that wine ferments and generates gas as it gets to certain ages where curing is wine. Old wineskins are already stretched out and dry and brittle. And new wine, Jesus said, will burst the wineskins and be spilled, and the wineskins will be ruined. But new wine must be put into new wineskins, and both are preserved. So fasting is a New Testament principle. It's like a wineskin. But Christ, coming to bring a new covenant, wanted to make a clear distinction between the old covenant and the new. The new was something New. The old was going to be fulfilled. No mixing up the two. And so his disciples broke all the ceremonial laws that man had come up with, you know, like eating without their hands washed. And you know how people do. We like to add rules to rules. And so he was making something new. And so there was no fasting when he was here. He said, when I leave, then there will be some fasting. Newness requires not only a changing of the old, it requires a replacing of the old. And he goes on and says this thing that's true, it's a reality. No one having drunk old immediately desires new, for he says the old is better. Even in our current day, we experience that. With each generation, there's a new sound, contemporary sound. The old hymns of today were hated in the day That they were written. Did you know that? What was Martin Luther thinking when he changed the words to a bar song and put lyrics to it that we sing, A mighty fortress is our God. I don't know what the German words were to the original tune, but maybe I imagine it being, I got cold beer here in my sty. (laughs) So people no doubt hated it. They say the old is better. Now, I I think we're living at a really great time 
Churches that have contemporary services and traditional services are now having blended services. And I have to say, there is nothing better than an old hymn with a contemporary edge on it. Oh, my goodness. It's alive. So the worship wars are over, I think. But it's, it's in the Bible. I mean, Jesus said people prefer the older wine to the new. That's the way it happens. Now, I'm no connoisseur of wine. I overdid it when I was 19 with Boone's Farm. I can't stand the stuff. It's like fingernails on the chalkboard. Gives me the creeps. Although Bailey's on ice cream is not too bad. But. <laughs> Knowing God in newness involves a new covenant, a new agreement. When Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper... He took the cup and said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood which is shed for you. He made the covenant and we drink the remembrance of it. It was done for us. Was it raining out there when you got to church today? Anybody come in the rain? Did you enjoy the new drive through That big, ugly green front on it is going to be stuccoed and painted the color of stone. And then the Lord willing, on that will go a four-foot version of our logo, green. So it'll look nice, lit up at night from external lights that shine on it. And the logo looks like a circle with a cross in it. Oh, how sweet. But it's a little more than that. If you look at it, it's got great detail. It's a G facing an inverted C. So you see the G, the G facing a C, YMCA. Stands for Generations Church of Granbury. Great, okay. But it also stands for, because there's a cross in the middle, God made a covenant with God on the cross. He did it for us. Man broke the first covenant. Man cannot break the second covenant. Because God made the covenant with God on the cross. Remember Jesus, the man, the Son of Man, was also the Son of God. He was God. And he made the covenant and arose from the dead, sealed in his blood, conquered death, hell, and the grave, and arose from the dead as our lawyer to make sure it is carried out. It's awesome. It's a better covenant. The old covenant was full of requirements. The new covenant is full of provision. Christ has met the righteous requirements of the law. He fulfilled them so that we could have a relationship with him. And he provides the way. He provides the leadership. Which covenant is better? The old covenant is beautiful because it points to Christ. If you want to do Shabbat, understand it points to Christ. If you want to do Passover, understand it points to Christ. But I have a real concern that there's a certain element, you know, winds of doctrine blow through the land at times of a fascination with the Jewish feast days and people are trying to practice the law again. You cannot practice the law. No one can fulfill it. You can't do it. Cannot do it. You're treating it like a cafeteria, picking and choosing your favorite parts. We have the New Testament we live under. The Old Testament, we understand the beauty of the new. Here's the importance of the Old Testament. How many has ever seen a diamond? They're beautiful, aren't they? Have you ever seen a diamond against a dark satin pillow? Oh, it really shines it off, right? The appreciation of the new grows when you understand the old. We have a better covenant. All right, moving on. Knowing God in newness involves a new birth. Jesus told Nicodemus, most assuredly, most assuredly, He emphasized it. I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. He told other people they couldn't enter the kingdom unless they became as a child. This is a new beginning that he invites us into where we have to become teachable like children. Be born again. Knowing God involves being made new. Like an old caterpillar, his cocoon becomes a new butterfly. We're cocooned by the grace of God, and he's making us metamorphose us as new creatures. Knowing God in newness involves a new commandment. 
Christ came and said the law and the prophets hang on two commandments, loving God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second commandment is like the first, loving your neighbor as yourself. But then he gives this new commandment, a new commandment I give to you that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this will all men know that you are my disciples. This is our T-shirt. This is our bumper sticker. This is our badge that shows we're a disciple of Christ. If you have love one to another, be careful how you live. You may be the only Bible some people will ever read. Do they know we're his disciples by our love? Knowing God in newness involves a new life, a new way of living, an abundant life, new life. Romans 6, 4, and talking about water baptism, says we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. So we believe Christ died for our sins, he was buried, and he arose from the grave in resurrection power and ascended. We believe that. And so in becoming believers, we die to self. We embrace the new life that he gives us. And we're buried in baptism. And we rise to walk out the resurrection. That is, in the newness of life. New life. But because we've lived the old life for so long, It's a period of spiritual growth in our life. This is our discipleship. Learning to love one another is part of how we walk it out. This new life, this newness of life is walked out in love. And many times somebody makes us mad. Here comes the old ways again. We start heading the wrong direction in our living. Going down or going up. Which elevator are we taking? Knowing God in newness involves a new way of thinking, a new mind, a new attitude. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who was God, but yet he became man. And as man, he became a servant. And as a servant, he died the death of a criminal. He humbled himself. This is the kind of minds we're to have. Our minds are to be renewed, humbling ourselves. Romans 12, 2 begins with, Do not be conformed to the world but be transformed or metamorphed morphed by the renewing of your mind. And our minds are renewed through reading the scriptures, through meditating on godly principles and through worship and prayer and fellowship with people that will encourage you in your spiritual growth. Knowing God in newness involves a new identity. Can we say identity? If anyone is in Christ, 2 Corinthians 5.17 ends with these words. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, look, all things. All things new, and I will follow you forward. All things have become new. This is a new identity. Embrace your new identity. Stop relating to yourself on the past. I'm just an ex-con. No, you're a mighty man of God. I have regrets. No, you're a mighty sister in Christ. You're a mighty woman of God. A new spiritual DNA is yours. Knowing God in newness involves a new name. Jesus told John in Revelation 2, To him who overcomes, I will give some of the hidden manna to eat. That's spiritual manna. That's revelation. That's inspiration. And here's here's some of right here in this very verse. I will give him a white stone. What's a white stone? What's this about? Well, historically, people would vote with rocks. You had the white rocks and the black rocks, or the light rocks and the dark rocks, and you would vote with rocks. People would throw rocks at you. That's an expression. Stoning. 
till dead was a form of capital punishment. The voting was a form of honoring. Even to this day in Jewish culture, people will put rocks on gravestones to show honor. If you go to Corey Ten Boom's grave to this day, you will have to move rocks out of the way to be able to see her name. Google it. Look at the image of Corey Ten Boom's grave. You'll see just rocks everywhere. It's a sign of approval. The Lord extending you a white stone is a sign of approval. Over time, this stoning or rocking with honor and voting evolved into more sophistication using balls. Here's an ancient voting machine. It's used in the Masonic lodges, probably not used today, but they'll have them in their museums. You have white balls and black balls, and you vote with these things. You heard the expression, they blackballed me? Where'd that come from? It came from this. To vote against someone or vote against something, use the black ball. To vote for something, use the white ball. Our word ballot is related to the word ball. So you notice on your left is a tray or a box of balls, white and black. And then above that tray is a hole where you would cast your ball or your ballot or your vote. And it would fall down into this drawer. And when everybody in the lodge is done voting, you pull the drawer out and count the black balls versus the white balls to decide whether the vote carried or didn't carry. Christ votes for you. And he doesn't just stop there. On that white stone, there's a new name written. There's a new you. The name through which I believe he relates to you even now. Which no one knows except him who receives it. So it's your name. Now the Bible says in heaven we'll be known as we're known. So I cross paths with Jackie. I say, hey, Jackie, let me introduce you to my other friend, Jackie Langham. But if we have new names, will we have to wear name tags? I don't know. Knowing God and newness will eventually involve a new earth and sky. Revelation 21 verse 1 begins with these words. Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Now this word heaven isn't the capital H heaven. It refers to the, to the heavens or the atmosphere surrounding the earth. Is it a renewing of this planet? I don't know. But the Bible says this place is going to melt with a fervent heat one day. You talk about global warming, it's going to get really hot. Not saying we need to be speeding it up or anything. We need to be good stewards. But there's a new destiny to look forward to, a new planet that involves this newness that the new covenant brings us, assures us of citizenship. You already have a dual citizenship. You're a citizen here on this planet, and you're already a citizen there. It involves a new Jerusalem, a new city of peace. Verse 2 of the same chapter, John writes that he saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God like a bride adorned for her husband. Glorious in majesty, beauty, jewels and precious metals and huge dimensions. Does it rest on the planet or is it above the surface of this new planet like the moon? I don't know, but the point is we have something to look forward to that's involved in knowing God because of the new covenant. Knowing God and newness involves a new everything. We're new creatures because of him who makes all things new. Verses 4 and 5 of Revelation 21 says, God will wipe away every tear from the eyes of people on this new planet. There will be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There should be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. No more tornadoes and earthquakes and storms. No more wars and terrorism and suffering. No more politics. Hallelujah. Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. This is towards the end of the Bible. This is where we're heading. 
you get discouraged, you get down, go to the back of the book. I don't like to do it, but if you ever read a novel, if you tempted to go go to the back of the book, see how it ended, and then, well, how in the world they get there? I'm going to have to read the whole thing. Well, in the Christian walk, you can go to the back of the book and see how things are going to wind up. But it's through knowing God, it's through this relationship that he makes all things new. This new earth is a desire in all mankind. Everybody has this desire for something better. Even, you may find this hard to believe, even those involved in uh, radical Islamic terrorism are doing it because they think there's some kind of utopia coming to them and coming to the planet through their efforts. People want all things new. The good news of the gospel is Christ is the one that's going to do it, not through our efforts. Our efforts is to make disciples and to represent him and to serve people and show his love everywhere we go. But there is a strong desire in man's hearts for something better than what we've got. Yes, pastor does listen to secular music sometimes, and this will date me. But this was one of my favorite albums when I met a vet. Crosby, Stills, Nash and Young, with Dallas Taylor and Gary uh, Reeves, Deja Vu. And on that album is a song about Woodstock. And a lot of people think that Woodstock was just about getting high and partying and living in debauchery. It, It wound up in that, but that wasn't the heart, that wasn't the desire that started the hippie movement that got led astray. And it's reflected in this song. It says, I came upon a child of God. He was walking along the road. And I asked him, tell, where are you going? This he told me. He said, I'm going down to Yasker's farm. Going to join in a rock and roll band. Got to get back to the land and set my soul free. Well then, can I walk beside you? I have come to lose the smog And I feel myself a cog in something turning. Maybe it's the time of year, then maybe it's the time of man. But I don't know who I am, but life is for learning. By the time we got to Woodstock, we were half a million strong. And everywhere was a song and a celebration. And I dreamed I saw the bomber jets riding shotgun in the sky turning into butterflies above our nation. It's a desire for peace. We are stardust. We are golden. We are caught in the devil's bargain. We got to get ourselves back to the garden. We are stardust. We are golden. We are caught in the devil's bargain. And we got to get ourselves back to the garden. That relates to Genesis chapter 3 directly. There's a desire in man to get back to the garden, knowing God in newness. Lord, I pray that this understanding that you make all things new would become very important to us, that we would value our relationship with you more in 2016 than ever before in our lives. Help us, Lord, to grow in grace and extend that grace to everyone in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray.
Jesus did not come to make us better persons. He came to make us new creations. Let him grow you. Become as a child. Let him disciple you. Learn to receive his love for you and extend that to others. Jennifer Sterling is coming back up. Make a special presentation. If I could have Stephanie Ford come up, please. So a little bit earlier in the service, I took a minute to tell you about our ministry and things that we do. And part of the reason that we're here today is to present Stephanie with a vehicle. Project 44, in conjunction with this church, wants to present this Ford Escape to you. Christ's love is here and new, and we're going to say a prayer over these keys of blessing. Lord, we thank you for Stephanie and her children, for their faith and their perseverance. Lord, we thank you for this provision. Thank you, Lord, for Project 44. We pray, Lord, for unprecedented blessings on this car, protection for them, angels every time they get in it. In Jesus' name, Lord, just build their faith today. Thank you, Lord, for Project 44. Continue to open doors and opportunities for them to do this more and more. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May God Almighty cause His face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May He lift up His countenance upon you and give you His peace. Peace that passes all understanding. Peace that comes from knowing Him. Peace from comes from knowing the end of the story. We win. May you walk in newness like never before in 2016. Go get them, Tigers. We'll see you next year. We just our cross. We are gold. And we've got the, the devil's body. But we've got to get ourselves back to the garden.